So like I said, tonight's draw is going to be all about King David or Dawid, as they would have been more accurately pronounced back then during his time. As I said before, if you'd like more notes and more information on this, go to GodHonestTruth.com, click on the post for this drosh, so you can get the video, the drosh slides, and the notes we took during the study all in one place. And of course, starting tomorrow morning, you'll be able to watch the on-demand video as well. Now, the first instance we see of King Dawid or King David is in 1 Samuel 16, 13, and it reads, and Shemuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of Yahweh came upon Dawid from that day and onwards. And Shemuel arose and went to Ramah. Now, for those of you who don't know, Shemuel or Samuel was the last judge of Israel before the line of kings or the group of kings that come along. And as the last judge, he was also a prophet. So he anointed not only the first king of Israel, but also the second king, Dawid. Now, if you remember from last episode we did on scriptural dossiers, we did that on King Shaul, and we went through his life and times, what led to his downfall, his ups and downs, all that stuff. So now we're getting into the time of King Dawid, and the first instance we see of King Dawid is in the passage we just read, 1 Samuel 16, 13. Now, Dawid, for those of you who are nerdy like me, comes from the Hebrew word, obviously, Dawid. means something like beloved or favorite. On your screen here, if you're watching the video, you can see the Strong's definition. And also down below that, Jusenius' Hebrew lexicon entry for Dawid. And here is the Brown Driver Briggs and the beginning of the Zondervan Illustrated Bible Dictionary entry. And the Hebrew word Dawid comes from Strong's H1732, if you'd like to look that up. And again, all this is going to be in the notes that we took, plus the expanded entries for each of these, as well as more information on King Dawid. Now, some things about King Dawid. He was the second king of Israel, obviously. We already covered that, and most of you know that already. He was anointed by the prophet Samuel, or Shemuel. David reigned for 40 years after he finally took the throne. We'll get into all that in just a moment. But he reigned for seven years in Hebron before the kingdom was united. And then he reigned another 33 years, do my math here, reigned for another 33 years in Jerusalem over all of Israel. Like I said, we'll be getting into some more details here as we get into the drosh. David was the son of Yishai, also known in the Anglican vernacular as Jesse. And they were descendants of Boaz and Ruth. If you like more information on that, go back and read the book of Ruth and David, Yishai, and now Messiah all came from that lineage of Boaz and Ruth. David was an ancestor of Yeshua, obviously, because Yeshua came from the line of David. David is described as ruddy, bright-eyed, and handsome. Unlike, if you remember, with Shaul, now, Shaul was described as being, you know, fair looking, but he was tall and built and muscular, like a stereotypical warrior king that you might think of. That's what the people liked about Shaul when they first saw him. David was different, though. David was more than likely a little bit smaller than Shaul, but he wasn't that stereotypical warrior king that you would think of when you're just looking at him. He was instead more like, I guess, the movie stars of today. Sha or, uh, Dawid was also a musician for Shaul. Now, when we looked at the life and times of Shaul in our last scriptural dossier, if you remember that once Shaul started his decline, that he was plagued by an evil spirit from Yahweh. And 
the only way he could get any relief from this was to have music played for him, especially by Dawid. So even though Dawid was playing this music for him and was already anointed as the next king of Israel, Shaul had no idea at this point. Some more statistics. Dawid, like his son Shalomo or Solomon, <clears throat> I'm sorry, let me back up real quick. Dawid was the youngest of eight sons. Now, if you remember when you read through the story of Dawid, it's a very, very interesting story. I invite you to go through the life and times of Dawid. But when Shemuel, the prophet Shemuel, goes to Yishai to find the next king of Israel, Yishai lines up his seven sons, and Shemuel goes through and says, no, he's not here. Do you have anyone else? And Dawid was actually out in the field tending the flocks. And he was the youngest of all those eight sons. Now, like his later son, Shalomo or Solomon, David had many wives. He first starts out by marrying the daughter of Shaul. Well, actually, the daughter of Shaul was given to Dawid as a wife. But then Shaul reneged on that and gave her to another man. But eventually, Dawid got her back. However, even though Dawid had many wives and concubines, only about eight or so are mentioned by name in Scripture. Here on your screen are a few of those. Abigail, Ahinoam, Michal, which is Shaul's daughter, Maaka, Hagith, Abital, Egla, and Bathsheba. He had many sons and daughters. About 19 of his sons are listed in Scripture along with one of his daughters, which makes, well, I don't want to say she makes a prominent appearance, but she is featured because something very terrible happens to her, which we will get to in just a moment. Now, ooh, excuse me. Like we said, with Shaul, he had a downfall. He did some things that were very, very not good, including disobeying Yahweh when Yahweh told him to go and just utterly destroy everything about the Amalekites. Shaul did not do that. He destroyed all this stuff that wasn't so nice, but then kept the really good stuff. Yahweh told him to destroy it all. Shaul even saved the king of the Amalekites, right? Agag. And it actually took Shemuel, the prophet, to finally fulfill what Yahweh had said. And Shemuel killed Agag. Well, because of all this that Shaul disobeyed on, there was another king that was anointed or chosen. And this was Dawit, as we see in 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now your reign is not going to stand. Yahweh shall seek for himself a man after his own heart, and Yahweh shall command him to be leader over his people, because you have not guarded what Yahweh commanded him, commanded you. So Shaul is told that he's going to be replaced. He doesn't know when, he doesn't know by who, but here from the prophet Shemuel speaking to Shaul, Shaul knows that he's going to be replaced because he screwed up. And then we go to 1 Samuel 16, 1. And Yahweh said to Shemuel, How long are you going to mourn for Shaul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Yisrael? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Yishai, the Bethlehemite, for I have seen among his sons a sovereign for myself. So now, like with Shaul, this next king of Israel was selected by Yahweh himself. Now, as we get into life and times, as we know, King Dawid sinned. He made some mistakes, and we're going to be talking about those in a little while. But we also know that Shaul made some mistakes, some grievous ones. So, Start thinking about these people who were personally selected by Yahweh himself. And then they screw up. 
does that mean that Yahweh didn't make the right decision? He selected the wrong person? Not at all. What it really comes back to is a matter of free will. Even though you have a purpose in life, even though you're supposed to do something, even though you're doing really good at a certain point in your life, you still have free will and you still have the ability and the chance to screw it all up. And we see this in the life of Shaul, and we also see the mistakes that King Dawid made, as we'll get into here as we go through this drosh. So Shemuel, the prophet, is told by Yahweh to fill his horn with oil, anointing oil for the anointing of the next king, and go to Yishai, or Jesse, as it's known in the English vernacular. So he goes up to Yishai in 1 Samuel 16, 11 through 13. And Shemuel said to Yishai, Are these all the young men? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and see, he is tending the sheep. And Shemuel said to Yishai, Send and bring him, for we do not turn round till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in, and he was ruddy, with bright eyes, and handsome. And Yahweh said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. And Shemuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of Yahweh came upon Dawid from that day and onwards. And Shemuel arose and went to Rama. So here we have the prophet Shemuel on the orders of Yahweh himself going to anoint the next king of Israel. Now this is something to remember right now for the rest of the story of Dawid and the rest of Drash. He is anointed as king here. There's already a ruling king in place in Israel. Shaul, but the next one has already been anointed and put in place. This is going to come into play here in just a little bit as we get farther into the narrative of King Dawit. So now David's ascendancy to the throne was not one that was very smooth and was definitely not one that was easy for just about anybody involved. Number one, David did not physically ascend to the throne until the previous king, Shaul, had died. Now remember, Shaul reigned for about 40, 42 years, okay? So eventually, because of all his downfalls, Shaul and three of his sons are killed in battle, okay? Well, Shaul's not really killed in battle, he kills himself. But anyways, he dies during a battle, However, after Shaul dies, Dawid is supposed to be the rightful king. Well, he is the rightful king, and everyone is supposed to recognize that. However, not everyone does. And one of Shaul's sons, Ishbosheth, assumes the throne. He thinks that since his daddy was a previous king, and he's probably the only son left, that he has title to the throne. But this is not the case. Not according to Yahweh. Yahweh didn't anoint him. Yahweh anointed Dawid. So like I said, David was reigning in Hebron in the northern part for about three and a half years, while Ishbosheth reigned in the south, down in Judea, Jerusalem, area around there. Oh, well, I'm sorry. David was in Hebron for seven and a half years. There we go until the conflict with Ishbosheth was resolved. Okay, so it took that long for them to finally come to the conclusion, the finale. At that point, David was the undisputed king over all Israel. And this was recognized by everyone at this point. But still, there was more turmoil to come. However, he was king over all of Israel at this point. So in total, including his time in, of reigning at Hebron and also his time reigning over all of Israel, David reigned for about 40 years. That's what we're told in 2 Kings. 
Then we see in 1 Kings 2, 10 through 11. And I'm sorry, we're told in 1 Kings how many years Dawid rules. But then we see in 1 Kings 2, 10 through 11. And Dawid slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of Dawid. And the days that Dawid reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years. Now, if you're a nerd like me, you start seeing kind of some things here. When you look at scripture, and it's talking about before he died, right? It says that he reigned in Hebron or was in Hebron for seven and a half years. Okay. Then he was, mathematically, that would be that he ruled over all of Israel after that for 32 and a half years. Okay. However, as we see in this section, it says he reigned seven years. Kind of makes you wonder that in their way of speaking, do they round down the half part when talking about stuff like this? I don't know. If you've heard about something like that, please let us know. It's just one of those things on the back burner. It's not really important, but it did catch my eye. However, even though David was a man after Yahweh's own heart, like we said, he made mistakes as well. Most notably, David saw and lusted after another man's wife called Bathsheba. Now, unfortunately, he committed this sin, and then soon after that, Bathsheba comes up and tells them, Hey, I'm pregnant, right? Well, at that point, David is not very comfortable with the situation. And so he tries to cover it up. He brings Bathsheba's wife, Uriah, back from the battlefront and tries to get him to spend the night with her so that maybe the timing is close enough that he can pass off the pregnancy as Uriah's child. However, Uriah did not play along like Dawid wanted him to. He wouldn't go to his house with Bathsheba and said he stayed with the servants and told him, you know, all the other people are out fighting. I really shouldn't be getting this special treatment or nothing like that. So Dawid could not get Uriah to go spend the night with Bathsheba in order to try and pass it off as Uriah's child. So David's next step was to try and cover it up through murdering Uriah. Well, in a sense, murdering Uriah. He sends Uriah back to the battlefront and sends a letter along with Uriah, I'm sorry, by Uriah, to one of Dawid's commanders. And Dawid instructs his commander to put Uriah in the thick of it, in the midst of the fighting, put Uriah there, and then back off so that Uriah gets killed. Well, this works. So Uriah is dead, Bathsheba is pregnant with David's son, and now Dawid is thinking, okay, maybe I got past this. Oof. Didn't really happen. But after Dawid has Uriah killed, Bathsheba then gives birth to Dawid's son that he impregnated Bathsheba with. But this was not to be either. The child dies, actually, because of the sin that Dawid had committed, the multiple sins at this point. So David goes and fasts while the child is sick. And when the child dies, then he starts eating again. We covered that, I think, in the fasting part that we did a couple weeks ago. But anyways, he committed this sin of adultery. He committed this sin of murder. Now he's lost his child. And at some point he probably thinks, okay, bad things have happened, but I've gotten away with it. Then another prophet, after Shemuel, comes to David, the prophet Nathan. And he informs David through a parable that his sin with Bathsheba is known, and also his killing of Uriah. 
And like I said, David's son that he uh, had through Bathsheba died because of all this going on. So after being told by the prophet Nathan that David's sin was known, then David repents. He reconciles with everyone he needs to, including Yahweh. And this is... Lost my train of thought. So anyways, yeah. He goes back. Oh wait, this is what I was going to say. This is an important point for us all to remember. Is that even though the family may be gone, or maybe you're single, you have these times when you're by yourself, and you think, okay, those things I can't do normally, I can do now. Because no one's looking, right? As we see from this example of David, and also other examples in Scripture, we're not getting away with it. There may not physically be another person in the room with us, watching us, whatever we do, but Yahweh knows what it is that we do. So our actions are known, whether they're recorded or seen by another human being is irrelevant, because Yahweh knows, and we don't get away with it. Just like King David here. He thought he might have got away with it. He thought he might have covered it up. But Yahweh knew. And he disclosed it to Nathan. Nathan let David know that his sins were known. Fortunately, Dawid repented and got back right with Yahweh. However, it wasn't enough to save his son. For David and Bathsheba, they're now married. Bathsheba is now David's wife because... Technically, I guess she would be considered a widow, and then David married her because he wanted her anyways. But now David, I'm sorry, Bathsheba is David's wife, and they have another son. They get Bathsheba gets pregnant with another son by David. And this is David's son, Shalomo, better known in the English tongue as Solomon. So obviously. Solomon or Shlomo lives. But this is not the end of the troubles for Dawid. Because of what he's done, there are still more troubles to come. And unfortunately, some rather heinous ones too. For example, David's son Amnon ends up raping his half-sister Tamar. He calls her in, he pretends to be sick, has her come to his room to bring him something to eat, and then he grabs her and rapes her because he looked at her, thought she was beautiful, and loved her so much, does this grievous act against her, and then when it's all done, he ends up hating her even more than what he loved her beforehand. And it's just very odd. He ends up kicking her out of the bedroom after he does this to her because he hates her so much. Well, another one of King Dawid's um, sons finds out about this. His name is Absalom. And Absalom ends up biding his time for a while, for I think it's about two years or so. And then he gets his revenge and kills Amnon for raping his full sister, but Amnon's half-sister. So Absalom finally gets his revenge, but Absalom is harboring a grudge against his father, Dawid, because Dawid didn't really do anything to Amnon for this heinous sin. So Absalom's got his revenge on Amnon, but still kind of has ill feelings toward Dawid. Because of this, Absalom then goes on to stage a coup against his own father and the rightful king of Israel. He tries to take it over, and he makes progress for a while. He even ends up having or uh, making Dawid flee for his life, runs him out of Jerusalem, and Absalom gets up on the throne in Jerusalem. He goes so far as to even sleep with Dawid, his father's concubines, to try and sully them 
and just completely ruin Dawid. But still, after all this that Absalom does to Dawid, Dawid still commands leniency towards Absalom. He still loves his son and commands his underlings to, you know, show leniency when they catch up to Absalom. Not just cut his head off all at once to bring Absalom to him. However, during one of the battles, Absalom ends up running away from David's men, and Absalom is described as being handsome like Dawid was and having long hair. Well, when he was fleeing, his long hair ended up getting him tangled up in a tree branch, and he ends up hanging there by his hair. And some of Dawid's men catch up to him finally. They throw some spears into his heart and then go around piercing him with swords and kill him. So that's the end of Absalom, and that's the end of the coup. But still, that's a lot to go through for one man, Dawid. He's had a lot go on in his life. Some of it he's brought upon himself. Still, a lot that's happened to him. But what about the Davidic legacy? What kind of lasting impact did King David have? Well, as we know from our studies and talking about Judaism and stuff like that, still, King David is still highly regarded within Judaism. He's still pretty much highly regarded within Christianity as well. And even in the Hall of Faith, as we call it, in Hebrews chapter 11, he still gets a mention there. We look at Hebrews 11 chapter, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 34. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to relate of Gidon and Barak and Shimshon and Yifta, also of Dawid and Shemuel and the prophets who through belief overcame reigns, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. So, maybe a quick reference in the Hall of Faith, but he still makes it into the Hall of Faith. He's also mentioned in Acts 13.22. And having removed him, he raised up for them Dawid as sovereign, to whom also he gave witness and said, I have found Dawid, the son of Yishai, a man after my own heart, who shall do all my desires. Now, how would you like that to be said about you? That someone writes about you and they say, hey, that is a man after Yahweh's own heart. I mean, that would be pretty awesome. May our lives be like that. May our lives truly be about Yahweh's own heart and his will and his purpose. That's how Dawid is described. May we be so as well. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Do not be led astray. Elohim is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. Because he sows to his own flesh, shall reap cor- <clears throat> because he sows to his own flesh, shall reap corruption from the flesh. But he who sows to the spirit shall reap everlasting spirit. Or I'm sorry, shall reap everlasting life from the spirit. And we can definitely see this coming into play in the life of King Dawid, from the mistakes he made, what he sowed to the consequences of what happened, what he reaped. There was another time in the life of King Dawid where he kind of took it upon himself to have power and to assume power to overtake other armies and stuff. He took his census. And you might think that was, you know, kind of benign. But that was not in Yahweh's will and plan. Yahweh had not told him to take a census, and instead, Dawid should have relied on Yahweh and not on his own strength. So he's heavily chastised for that as well. Again, I highly invite you to go read through the life and times of Dawid. Very good story. 
not that long, goes from um, 1 Kings 16, no, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 16, all the way through 1 Kings. And then we look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that all matters work together for good to those who love Elohim, to those who are called according to his purpose. Dawid was definitely called according to the purpose of Yahweh. Now, it was not that all things in Dawid's life were good, nor that he'd always done good. But all things in Dawid's life were worked together for good by Yahweh. Well, how is that so? Well, think about it. He lusted after another man's wife, committed adultery, killed that man because of his lust for this woman. But through that, we have Solomon or Shalomo and the lineage that came down all the way to Yeshua. Yeshua was of that lineage. From that union of Dawid and Bathsheba. So, even though all things are not good, all things work too good for those who love Yahweh and follow after his heart and are called according to his purpose. And as most of you know, there's a lot of connection between King Dawid and our Messiah, Yeshua. For instance, both Yeshua and Dawid were from Bethlehem, as we read when Shemuel went to Yishai, it was in Bethlehem. They had times in their life when they had to flee. In King Dawid's life, he had to flee several times from King Shaul, who was trying to kill him. He also had to flee from his son Absalom when Absalom was staging the coup. Yeshua, right after he was born, not long after he was born, his parents had to take him as a young child and flee to Egypt, right? There were times in the temple when Yeshua was a grown man that he fled from the Pharisees who were picking up stones to stone him. So both Yeshua and Dawid had times in their lives where they had to flee. Both Dawid and Yeshua were shepherds. Now, Dawid was a shepherd of actual physical sheep, and Yeshua is a shepherd of men. Both are warriors. Now, so far, Yeshua hasn't engaged his warrior side, except maybe for the money changers in the temple. On his second coming, that's what we're going to see. The end times. Yeshua, the warrior. But as we clearly see from the life of Dawid, Dawid was clearly a warrior, killing Goliath, slaughtering, or I'm sorry, killing the uh, Philistines and the Melekites and all the battles he won. Yawid, I'm sorry. Ah, oh, I'm getting tongue-tied tonight. Dawid and Yeshua were both warriors. They're both kings of Israel, which is Yahweh's kingdom. Dawid lived and was king for a certain amount of time. Yeshua is well, still king of Israel. Both Yeshua and Dawid were about Yahweh's own heart and Yahweh's will and Yahweh's purpose. We see that clearly described and pointed out about Dawid. We know that Yeshua was about the Father's will. He said he came not to do his will, but his Father's will. So they were both about the will and purpose of Yahweh. They were both of the same lineage. Remember we covered coming down from Boaz and Ruth through Yishai or Jesse to David to Solomon, Shalomo, on down to Yeshua. They were both of the same direct lineage. Yeshua was described as the son of David because of this. So both of them, both Dawid and Yeshua, had the same lineage. So, like I said, this is more of an overview. There was a lot of chapters in there. If we went through and read all of those and got into a lot of the historical background, this would have been much, much longer. 
like I said, I definitely invite you to go and read in Scripture about the life and times of Dawid, what happened in his life, what he did, what he said, everyone else that came into his life, things like that. It's a very, very intriguing and engaging read, and you will be blessed because of it and know a lot, lot more. And as always, we always invite you to go on and do further study for yourself apart and above what you've learned here in this teaching.